this is a presentation that was um, was very interesting to me, and it's something I actually hope to kind of continue to to um, you know kind of collect and repackage every year. So this presentation uh, was initially delivered as technical support cases that everyone should know about, and honestly, it's a bit of a work in progress. Through last year, through 2019, I delivered this at a few user groups and. Um, towards the end of the year, a few user group meetings, and then, of course, right at the end of the year, beginning of, of this year, I presented it at 3D Experience World in uh, Nashville. And that allowed me to kind of collect technical support cases throughout that period of time and uh, boil them down to, hey, this was what was interesting about this support case, and this is why I think it's worth mentioning. And that's really what this presentation is all about. It's not to to you know, cover the nitty gritty of every single support case we've been through or, or, you know, tell you the most complicated cases, even it's more so, hey, these are ones that stood out as being interesting for one reason or another. So it's a completely biased <laughs> presentation because it was interesting to me. And, um, you know, I, again, I guess it's a little bit biased, but um, with with my experience in technical support, I found that in a lot of scenarios, the more interesting cases kind of Kind of bubble up and um, and uh, that's just kind of where uh, how the cases flow right the more complex ones kind of end up uh, with me eventually or maybe with one of the other leaders on the team. So, with that said, my current role at CATI is managing uh, a portion of the technical support team. So there's a few managers here that we collectively uh, manage a, a large group of really talented support engineers and uh, we're always always here ready to help you if you want to give us a call. Couple of pictures there, me and my wife and our crazy son, Leon. This is a very accurate representation of my life in quarantine with a four year old uh, since March. So my nerves are, might be a little bit uh, on edge and completely shot at this point. So uh, we'll, we'll just bear that in mind. There's also the strong chance that he could come barreling through the door at any moment. And I've asked my wife to restrain him for the next 90 minutes, if, if at all possible. <laughs> so we'll see how that plays out. And uh, I like to brew beer on the side, went to Temple University here in Philadelphia. And uh, yeah, I've just, just been working in the reseller space since 2008, tech support training, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, consulting, application engineer work, presentations, that kind of stuff. So this particular presentation um, kind of built itself to, to some extent because in my current role, I, I handle and I'm involved with a lot of different support issues on varying topics. So with that said, what are, what are our takeaways? What are we hoping to get from this? Um, a broad topic range covered in one presentation. So that, I think that's one takeaway here is the goal of this presentation isn't to drill down into any one area. It's to cover a wide, uh, a wide palette of different things and maybe just touch on a lot of different things. And if there is one in particular that you want more information about or one in particular that you think, hey, that's something that that impacts us a lot, we'll reach out. I'd be happy to dig into it and, and uh, take a closer look at it. It's also a chance to kind of look behind the scenes of our support team or really of any support team with as much transparency as possible and just say, hey, this is how I would go about troubleshooting something like that um, while, you know, of course, protecting um, the, the privacy of the customer's files and not showing anything proprietary and that kind of stuff, of course. But we want to give you a look behind the scenes of how we would troubleshoot something here in tech support. And maybe takeaway number three is to challenge our support team. If, if you haven't given us a call in a while or if there's something that has been bugging you or, or an issue you've just been dealing with, something you're just like, oh, I'll get to fixing that one day. I'm just going to deal with it for now because I have stuff to get done. Uh, challenge our team. Give us a call, send us an email, and let's see if we can help you get around it uh, for whatever reason. Okay, so what are we going to cover? I know this is a big list and, and I won't bore you with reading through the entire list, but I wanted you to see the at least the, the how many cases we had here and again, kind of just get an idea for, wow, we're going to jump from simulation to PBM to a bill material case, a bunch of why is SolidWorks slow, um, some standard sheet metal stuff, PDF printing issues, like a really a wide variety of things all in, uh, in, in the next 90 minutes or so here. So um, this is the goal to get through all of these, these cases. Uh, I'm also going to do as much of this live as possible, which means 
um, things happen, right? Um, we're, we're doing this, uh, we'll do it live. <laughs> we're gonna do this live and go through as much as we can. But I also want this to be interactive. So if if you even disagree with something here or you wanna see something different, feel free to, uh, feel free to throw a note in the chat. Bob is gonna be watching the chat and, and can kind of relay any questions or notes here. And uh, we, we could go off on a tangent or, or take a look at anything additional you wanted to do. Okay, so let's dive right in. Question one or case one here, right, right away, we're starting off with simulation. And I'm gonna do this in a bit of, uh, I don't know, you wanna call it like, like question and answer format or, or almost like Jeopardy format, starting with, um, starting with the answer or giving the answer right away and then we'll work our, work our way back here. But the question that came in to support that and, and support questions are are um, interesting because one in some cases a customer is asking one thing but they really mean another or, or they're really they're really um, running into a totally separate issue that they're not even realizing. So in this case, the the question was, hey, why when I change the stress on my model in a simulation study, why do the results look the same? Why do the deformation results look the same? And what that means is, and we'll show you an example here in a second, but as a customer dials up the stress placed on an item in a study, in a simulation study, why is the item not flexing more? You would imagine that the item should flex or should change more as more stress is applied. So let's just take a look here. And this is a simplified, boiled down, watered down example. And that's the whole point is I'm not showing the original customer file or, or even anything nearly as complex. And I wanna simplify it as much as possible. So here we have a very simple study where the model is fixed at the bottom, loaded on the top. It's made out of, I think in this case, uh, 1060 alloy. And we wanna see how this thing behaves under that stress. So if we pick displacement and we'll just, we're already showing displacement, we could even, um, I think we were showing stress actually, we could animate displacement again. And the question is from the customer, great, okay, I can see what happens when 50 pounds is applied to this small face at the top of this part. What happens if we change that force? What happens if we change that force? I'll edit definition. We change this force to, you know, something a lot greater, right? 500 pounds. And we rerun this study. And this is pretty short, so this should run uh, pretty quickly. Let me reapply those loads here. Okay, so this is on this phase, 500 pounds. We'll hit green check and we will rerun this study. No loads are applied to the model. That's a new one. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's, I'll tell you what, let's just do an, uh, a new study. I did load this study from my other machine, so uh, we run into that. So we'll do a new simulation study. This is really simple and straightforward, so no reason we can't just do another one. I'm choosing just a plain old static study, but you can, of course, see all the other available studies with simulation. And let's just do this one from scratch. There's really no reason, uh, no reason not to here. So we'll go ahead and fix the bottom of our model. And you can imagine maybe you're just saying, hey, that model is permanently attached to another. It's welded. It's bolted. It can't move, whatever the, whatever the, the case may be. We're going to go ahead and apply a load. So we'll click our, our load and apply a force. I've already kind of split off a little piece up here, right? To say that this should be 50 pounds or whatever the case may be. I want it applied only to there, not across the entire face. So we'll hit green check. I've applied a fixture. I've applied a load. This part, let's make sure it does have a uh, material. So we'll just make sure this is set to maybe like again, a 1060 alloy here. And then we'll run this study. Okay. So before we see this thing, this displace about as, as much as maybe we would expect it to. It's it's a thin, long piece of metal made out of aluminum with with some some weight applied to it. So sure enough, yeah, it does it does bend. But the question from the customer is: I'm changing this. I'm dialing up these results. I'm I'm dialing up this force rather. Why is my model not changing? So I just changed that to 500 and we'll rerun. And just that quickly, it's gonna rerun and update the results and we'll animate once again. And I, I totally understand that question from the perspective of a customer in tech support. But the, the truth is this is a very new simulation user, a very um, you know a new user to using simulation inside of SolidWorks. And simulation is so easy to dive into that 
yeah, if you have SOLIDWORKS Premium, you could run a static study on your part, and there's really no reason, uh, no reason not to. But one thing you want to watch for when you're doing a study like this or a study um, really of any sort is the deformation scale. So simulation, in some cases, is just trying to give you an idea for how this is going to deform rather than um, you know, accurately animating how much it's going to move. It's more trying to exaggerate it and say, it's going to move in this direction. Is that how you would expect the model to behave under load? So under definitions for stress or even for displacement, instead of automatic, we can set it to true scale or even user defined and say, instead of letting the software uh, scale it or exaggerate the, the displacement or the stress animation, let's do a user defined animation here and we'll hit green check. We'll do that for displacement as well. Edit definition for displacement. We'll set displacement to one, we'll hit green check. And I want to animate displacement now, because if we animate it now, you notice it actually barely moves at all. It's a very small movement. We're getting a readout in millimeters or how much the, the entire model is actually moving at the very top. If we zoomed in, you could see, I'm, I'm sure on the web connection, that's probably not as smooth here, but it's a very, very small movement. And this is with 500 pounds. Certainly just an example, right? And the customer's model was way more complex and, and uh, had a lot more in, uh, intri uh, intricacies than that. But the point is, hey, this is a simple, simple answer, but it, it was interesting to me because simulation is so easy to dive into that um, you want to watch out for some of these things when you're when you're first getting started with uh, with SolidWorks simulation. And to further complicate this, actually, this customer was actually using Simulation Express, which Simulation Express is built into every single license of SolidWorks. So if I'm if I'm in SolidWorks. Simulation Express is built into every single version. And I don't even have to have, you know, professional or, or premium for that to happen or for that to work, right? If you do tools, Express products, Sim Express, that'll work there. But in Sim Express, you have even less control or no control over that deformation scale, kind yeah. of further, uh, further complicating it, right? So, so, Dan, there was actually a sub question that actually fits right into that. Um, can you briefly explain um, the process required to run Express, which is 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 in there? Um, but also, I would also add the caveat in there. Um, basically, says he has some users that prefer to use Express. Um, and can do you can you explain some of the the differences between what you would get in Express and standard premium? I mean, yeah. Solid for you. yeah, great question. I mean, I, I maybe understand the, I can't turn it on right now because we have full blown simulation running and I can talk to it too. I just, yeah, great. Open it up for you. No, 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 it's a great question. The biggest thing is with simulation express, you can run these studies on a single part, you know, in a, in a single part environment. So it would actually work here and it could give us very similar results here. And I, I guess I understand this, the point of our users prefer it because you get a nice wizard that kind of walks you through and says, have you applied a force? Have you applied a fixture? Have you meshed the model? And it kind of holds your hand and walks you through it, which is really nice. But I would think that after just a few times of getting used to the simulation tree, the full blown capability of, of being able to change scales and um, change messing controls on the fly. Uh, we could help those users get out of Express pretty quickly, probably. So the the other thing is you have to take into consideration what you get with Express. Um, with Express, you like like Dan said, you can only do it on parts. That's it. It's a static load. And the the most important thing there are the fixtures. The fixtures are always fixed matter what you don't get the option so that mesh in the location that you're holding it cannot rotate or translate in x y or z at all where if you're using simulation you can say well this is a slot that's going along a bolted connection well it's at the end of the slot that bolt that face can still spin around around the center of that axis but it can't move off 
So by doing that, you're going to get you're going to get more more stress in the model, or actually more stiffness in the model than you might actually see in real life. Sure. So it's, I mean, when you when you comes to simulation, there's what we what we model is pretty accurate, but it's the it's the restraints and the loads we put upon it, which is what's important to get a proper result. And with Express, you're you're not going to be able to go through all the real world scenarios. Cool. Thank you, Bob. Okay, great question, and keep them coming. If you have more questions, pop them in the chat here, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly address everything we can get to. And with that, let's get to question two here. How can we create a standard route? So right away, we're diving from simulation to SOLIDWORKS routing. So again, we're going to cover a wide topic of things here. How can we get a standard route that we can reuse again and again and revision manage in SOLIDWORKS PDM? So the answer was a command called reuse route, and that's, that's where we'll get to towards the end here. And I did make a YouTube tutorial on this topic uh, last year. So if you even just probably Googled SOLIDWORKS routing tutorial, YouTube, this would come up, um, but we, we could share that as well. But it's the same, same uh, content and, and same topic as what we can kind of briefly cover here. So back here in uh, SOLIDWORKS, I'm gonna hit R for recent documents and let's open up this uh, sensor enclosure. And the question really was, and this is just an example of data set. This is an old, Bob, maybe you know this one. This is from the late 90s, I think, this old enclosure data set here. But the question was, hey, we have this jumper cable that goes from board to board. We use it again and again. It never changes. It's the same two connectors and same cable. It has to be the same length. It's always the same length. Um, but it's obviously going to change shape. It's going to bend differently. It's going to move differently from assembly, assembly to board to board. So in SOLIDWORKS terms, that's a different part, right? If it's a different shape, if the geometry is different, it's a different part. So how do, how do we handle that with routing? And then, you know, to make things even more complicated, how, how do we handle that with SOLIDWORKS PDM? So with routing, let's make sure routing is turned on. So we'll just go to SOLIDWORKS add-ins here and we'll turn on routing. Routing is great because it, it just automates having to do all of the sweeping and connecting and 3D sketching that it would, would be needed to, to create wires like this, right? And that's how this one was created already. It's just dragging in a couple connectors and then we end up with a nice uh, swept wire from connector one to connector two and it will give you links and uh, cut lists and electrical bill materials and a lot of great stuff. But the challenge is, you know, if I want to reuse that, recreate it, I, I don't want to have the users have to do that every time, drag those parts in. So let's just try a different method here. The first method was this uh, command called standard cables. And standard cables got us most of the way there, but spoiler alert, again, it wasn't, wasn't the complete solution, wasn't the complete answer, but it's still really powerful. Standard cables can take a predefined list of cables. So I'll just choose this RJ45 connector standard cable that I previously made. And once I, cho uh, once I choose that, I can decide how long do I want this cable to be totally. I want it to be 260 millimeters long in this case. You can also decide should it have uh, a, a, a specific diameter and should it have a minimum bend radius and, and preventing it from getting bound up in any, any certain spots. You can specify all that and then you can hit insert cable and it essentially puts you right into adding those connectors so i'll drop the first one there and maybe the the second one on the end or even on the middle and routing uses um mate references so these parts snap right into place for us we are, we're going to get a uh, a final prompt here to auto route between those two components we'll hit green check and then just like that we've inserted a standard cable or a standard route. So that's not too bad, right? That, that got us there pretty quickly. The users can have a list of cables that we can insert uh, frequently and do that over and over again. The only challenge with that is that route doesn't exist prior to that. It's, it's just there as a library. It's not there as a part that we can manage in PDM. So the second command we utilize, and this is what ended up being the answer, was reuse route. 
So reuse route is, is kind of similar to standard cables, but reuse route allows you to browse and choose an existing route to reuse in the assembly that you're in. And as I'm hovering over these, it's fun. You get um, kind of like previews of these different routes as you click one and say, do I want to reuse that one or reuse that one? This was the first one that was in the assembly, this harness to sensor enclosure uh, sub route here. I'm just choosing it because it's in this assembly, but you can also browse. So when we bring PDM into the mix, PDM embeds itself in Windows Explorer or in SolidWorks here in, in Windows. So I can just browse directly into a PDM vault and choose that route if I have it uh, saved there in PDM. Just for example's sake, I'm just going to drop this one that we already have uh, have picked or have kind of selected. So we'll choose this sensor to uh, closure and then it'll do something similar to the last command. It basically just asks you to route those or, or drop those parts. So we'll drop those kind of in place where they should be. And then we'll hit green check. I think this one had a longer length, so it's kicking the wire out. But um, the point of this is because of the ability to save this in PDM, to, to define it and control it in PDM, the customer knows that every time they drop that in, that wire is going to be the same length and it's managed and always going to be the same route out of PDM. So this ended up being a pretty, pretty cool one and they were, they were pretty happy with the solution. And again, if, if you want to dig deeper into that, we did do a YouTube tutorial on that uh, middle, middle of last, uh, middle of last year, I think. Okay, so this was a, another interesting one. Now on to some bill of material questions and, and drawing questions. This is an interesting one because this option has been there forever and I see it all the time and I'm going to do a window close all just to free up some uh, free up some RAM here. I see it all the time and I think maybe this is an option that not a lot of us uh, spend a lot of time uh, looking at really. And I'll open up uh, our bomb uh, grouping example here. And I guess I'll just jump right into this assembly. We could do the bill material here on the drawing or we could do it at the assembly level. And for me in tech support, again, part of the transparency of this presentation is to say, how would I troubleshoot something like this? If a customer calls and says, hey, I'm having a hard time with this bill of material and this drawing, what I tend to do is go back to the assembly. Let's go to the assembly and do the bill of material there and see what the results are, because the, the drawing is probably just a, an innocent bystander here. So let's see what the, what the bill of material does at the, at the assembly level. So this is interesting. We have four unique parts, an arm, a motor, a prop, and a cap, but there's only three being listed in the bill material. And it's an old option. It's, it's been there for a long time, but if, if you're not watching for it, it can certainly cause some issues. And, and this is exactly what happened for, uh, for this customer. So we'll choose options here. We'll expand our part uh, configuration grouping. And this option for display configurations with the same name as one item. It should say, even if they are different parts, <laughs> we should put that on the end of that, uh, that text there. But if I turn that off and I just do another option, I see an additional part show up. So really all I did in this case was take two of these components, the, um, I think the arm and then the motor, and I gave them both one configuration with the same name, which was CATI. So if you're not, uh, you know, looking for this, if you have parts that maybe share configuration names and that option gets turned on in bill materials, you can end up with uh, items being grouped that otherwise shouldn't be. So in this case, we, we see two very different items that ended up being grouped that really had no business uh, being grouped at the assembly level or, or in, the, in the bill material. So that's, a, that's an interesting one, but it's been there for a long time. Maybe you've never experimented with that or seen it before, but display configurations with the same name as one item comma even if they are completely different part files <laughs> so watch out for that one okay i really like this one this one probably comes up for me once a year um, once a year maybe twice a year and i'm still so surprised that it happens and it does happen year after year that i've i've kept it here as an example um, because it even gets into pdm it even affects pdm so the question is, I'm just going to, while we're talking here, get some files open. The question is, um, I go to check some files into PDM 
And this drawing has some unwanted references to a part that doesn't make sense. It's like, hey, it's this drawing for whatever reason is pointing to another file and there's it has no business doing that. In fact, you know what, I'll just get that last drawing uh, back open here. It has no business calling a reference to those parts. I've never even used that part in this, on this drawing. I have no idea why that reference would be there. And when you take a drawing and check it into PDM or you take any assembly and check it into PDM, all it's really doing is this file find references and it looks to see what that uh, drawing or what that part um, is is uh, pointed to right so where is this drawing pointed it's pointed to all these parts that are um, you know back in this assembly we were just in and then inserted into into the drawing here and that's really what PDM uses to build its references list so again PDM is kind of like an innocent bystander here in the case where a customer has the view palette open, so the view palette, if you've never seen it, is this uh, pane over here on the right side. And you probably have seen this because it, it tends to open by default when you start a new drawing or when you insert a part into a new drawing. If I use this list here to browse to another part, maybe I'll go to somewhere where I know I have some other kind of random parts, right? Um, maybe some surfacing parts. If anybody's taken the surfacing exam recently, right? Maybe you've seen uh, a part like this. And I pull up a part just to see its views, right? Maybe just to, just to pull them in or, or just to use one of those views. And then if I end up not even using that part, not even making any views of it, not even inserting it or dropping it onto the drawing, file, find references, that surfacing part is now a reference to this drawing. Even though the, the part itself was not used on the drawing, it was never inserted onto it. If I took this drawing and tried to save it and check it into PDM, PDM would see that surfacing part. And PDM would ask you, hey, do you wanna check that surfacing part into the vault as well? As well? And that's usually when most users get caught by this as they say, why is, why is this random drawing pointing to that surfacing part? This happens in a lot of different scenarios. I mean, what I just did there is the most direct way to make it happen. But maybe you take a drawing and, and um, use it as a template for another drawing. Maybe you delete this view and you say, okay, great. I've wiped this drawing clear of any views that contained this part. And I'm gonna save a copy of this and insert another part onto it. But the view palette was previously populated with that part. That's, that's kind of one scenario where that can happen. The good news is we can fix it. All you really have to do is open this view palette and then hit X here to clear that out, to clear that connection to that part from the view palette. So if I do file, find references, that surfacing part is now gone. But that that still comes up and I'm in 2020 SP3. I'm in the latest and greatest version of SolidWorks here. And this is still happening. And in PDM, again, is where I think it's starting to kind of... Uh, rear its head a little more because PDM is all about references. It's all about connections between files. And that's one that can kind of catch you off guard. So sticking with PDM, this is another one that I, I kind of can't believe still happens, but it does. And I've seen it myself on my own machine. So let's just pull up Windows Explorer here. And one of the things I love about PDM again is that it embeds itself right inside of Windows Explorer and kind of just looks and feels like another folder. But the question from this customer is, why can't I see any of my files? Why is, why is nothing showing up when I browse to my PDM? Well, I just installed PDM or, hey, we just put PDM on a new user's machine and he can't see any files or she can't see any files. We're not sure what's going on. And it's as easy as this, this blue bar, this separation between the files and PDMs interface itself. I don't know why, but in some cases, even on a brand new machine, you'll install PDM and it will default to up here. And it's honestly that simple, but I'm mentioning it here because I find it interesting. These are cases that uh, in my biased opinion in tech support, I found interesting because if you're, if you didn't otherwise know that would that's not very self explanatory you're not going to just kind of bump into that to fix it. The other thing that happens with this is you can also set up PDM to be in a side by side view so have the files over here and the preview over on the on the right side and the separation will be through the middle horizontally instead of. Um, um, you know, across the across the middle this way so. Um, 
that either it's vertical or horizontal, whatever it is, it's the same issue. It's the blue bar needs to be uh, needs to be dragged and have the file shown. So don't belabor that one anymore, but watch for that. And uh, you know, you're definitely want to want to drag that down. The other thing that complicated this particular case was a customer had another option called show only local files turned on. And that's probably a little deep, a little too deep in the weeds than we need to get to in this case for PDM, but maybe I'll just kind of briefly open the, the PDM admin tool here just so we can kind of talk about it. The interesting thing about PDM is you can shoot, pick and choose how it displays files to you. It is constantly managing the files that are stored on your system versus the files that are stored on the server. And that's really what PDM is all about. So in this case, the, the customer was kind of had like a dual hold uh, issue. Even if we turn this on, they still need to drag that down. Even if they drag that down, they still would have had to turn that option on uh, as well. So again, maybe a little too deep in the weeds that we need to get to right now. But if, if you open your local view in PDM and don't see files, it's probably that blue bar, but there might be a little bit more uh, to the story as well. Jumping right back into kind of modeling cases, right? We're, we're a bit all over the place here, but that's the that's the nature of this presentation. And I really liked this question because the customer called in and said, hey, we're sweeping a shape around a corner. And it was, it was different than this. It was a very complex uh, sweep, but I simplified it uh, for, for, you know, uh, mostly proprietary reasons for them. But again, just so we kind of have a simpler example to work with. They're saying we're sweeping a shape around a corner but when we do that, our, our tooling or our part that we're using to press that ends up with some, some interesting faces or additional faces on it. So let's get that part open. I'll go to open here, go to our support cases folder, and I think we're all in question six here. So the question was, I'm extruding this, I'm extruding this shape up to this surface, up to this swept surface. And if we look at this swept surface options, one of the options is merge tangent faces, and this is actually off by default. So if this is off by default, you have a really simple sweep shape where it's just a, a couple of lines swept around a, kind of a, a bent uh, sketch here, right? So you end up with three faces on each side of this part, one, two, three on this side, and then of course, one, two, three on the other side, and then uh, vice versa with, uh, with the, the other leg of the, of the body. That's fine, and you know, to the to the naked eye, and if we turn off um, uh, hit, uh, hidden lines visible here, you wouldn't even really see those, right? But the challenge this customer was running into was we use this shape to actually produce um, negatives or produce molds or produce cores and cavities, and this other part, this kind of I, I use this term a lot during this presentation, innocent bystander. I should rename this presentation innocent bystanders. Uh, this part is, is impacted by that and ends up with a couple of additional little faces on it that don't really need to be there because this is one continuous, nice, uh, smooth surface. So the answer for this customer, and the reason I found this interesting, was merge tangent faces is off by default. Here we are, 2020 SP3, off by default for, for new sweeps. And if I turn that on, merge tangent uh, faces, I end up with you know really nice smooth uh, smooth transition there on that part. Of course, this is a simplified example, but you could imagine for for this customer with a larger part that they're doing a bigger impression of. Um, you, maybe you can imagine if you're doing some swept parts, you don't want to have to do any surfacing magic afterwards to to get one smooth continuous face. Uh, just look for those simple options that can end up uh, saving you a lot of time. Okay, back to PDM. I've lost two weeks of work. Is there any way to recover? How could PDM let this happen? So the question from this customer was, hey, I'm working in PDM. I've got some files. Um, I just did a get latest of the top level assembly. And all of a sudden I've lost a bunch of work um, to a, one of the parts in that assembly. And the answer ended up being, watch out for this message, confirm, replace, checked out file. So let's go to SolidWorks and we'll just do a really, uh, really simple example here. So once again, we'll do a window close all, just kind of clear out everything here. And in PDM, we have 
a couple of really simple drone uh, parts saved in there. So I have a drone assembly that I just threw into a brand new PDM vault, just as an example, so we can kind of see something, uh, uh, something similar. And in the drone assembly, we'll sort for top level assembly parts. And here's our top level uh, drone main assembly. And in the customer's example, this isn't their data, it's mine, but in the customer's example is really sim uh, similar. I'm working on, I, and I won't check out uh, the top level, we're only going to end up checking out the sub part. So I'm working on one of the sub parts of this assembly. Maybe it's the board that runs uh, across the top of this 3D printed uh, drone assembly. And I'm making some changes to it. And in this scenario, they hadn't checked in for a very long time. So that was probably the first maybe maybe mistake or maybe misstep here is checking in um, is great. It, it copies your version to the vault. It moves it securely your version you're working on locally to you know the, the secure vaulted environment on the server. But it's only as good as 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 often as you do it. It's very similar to saving. We need to check in often so we get our versions into the vault and, and back up our work. And, and of course, you know, there's there's some thought to say, hey, I don't want to check in all the time because we're adding all that extra data to the vault. But there's even some things you can do there to control uh, how much data ends up in the vault. But in this case, I'm going to do as simple of an example as possible. I pick maybe this front side face here and we'll begin a sketch on this front uh, front side face. And if I just did anything right, if I put a box on this face. It doesn't matter, even just a sketch. And if I jump back to, oh, you know what? I have to check this part out. My first, my first misstep here, <laughs> we'll check this part out. So a PDM also embeds itself inside of SolidWorks. So if I pick this part, check it out. Now we'll do our sketch. We'll pick this face and the sketch is still there. Perfect. So the, the idea is if you're a customer, right, if I'm if I'm a user of this and I've been working on this file for, in this case, it was a few days. Maybe you've done quite a lot of work to it and you either forgot to check in or you just didn't for whatever reason or it was the end of the day Friday and you went home and just let, left your machine on and went back to the top level assembly. And one of the other engineers says, hey, we changed a couple other parts in that assembly. Uh, you probably want to get latest or, or, or download the latest version of the overall file. Okay, no problem. Great, we can do that. Take the whole uh, file and get latest version of the entire assembly, and we'll just get everything here. So you, you can't see my other screen. We'll pull this over, and we'll just get everything. PDM is trying to warn you about something here. It's saying, you just tried to get latest of everything. Um, you've been editing a certain part in that assembly. Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to use the version from the vault and not continue with, with what you're doing? So the answer for this customer was, you need to be very aware of, of this message and be very aware of what's going on here because you're giving PDM the right to, you know, even though you've had that file checked out for two weeks or whatever the, the time period is, you're giving PDM the right to overwrite that version you have and at that point, there's no way to get that version back because it was only stored on your local machine. So this use version from Vault is basically the permission of the PDM to overwrite your uh, your local work. And here's the uh, keeps popping up on my other screen, but here's the same message for the the part itself. So we'll hit cancel here. Not going to uh, undo my work there. Not going to get rid of everything uh, we've we've worked on. But the lesson for this customer, un unfortunately, not a whole lot we can do to recover what you what you did lose, but we learned two things. W one, save and check in often. We, we all have been using SolidWorks for, for years and have gotten used to the idea you should be saving often. And you can apply that directly to checking in as well. You should be checking in often every time, every time uh, you, you have a certain level of production or a certain level of changes that you just couldn't stand to lose if, if something were to happen. If, if your hard drive crashed, if, if it's not checked in, that version, that information only exists on your local hard drive. The vault will have backups. The vault is, is great because it, it has the last time it was checked in and you can just revert to that version. But 
is still only as good as as the last time uh, it was checked in. So watch for this message and also save and, and check in often. This is the kind of question in tech support. That's me just kind of fading back into the bushes, right? It's like, oh no, I've lost two weeks of work and is there anything I can do to recover? Uh, how could PDM let this out? I would never actually do that, of course, but this is, this is the initial feeling you get. It's like, oh boy, this is gonna be one of those calls. Okay, so I have a few parts to this next question and this is one that built upon itself several times over and I even have more information this year um to share and, and by the way i'm working on this presentation for next year so if you're if if uh if we happen to go to solidworks world or, or 3d experience world again hopefully we'll have a, an, an updated version of this presentation at that point but part one of why is my solidworks so slow even after clearing the registry updating the graphics card you know what are the things we tell you to do in tech support if you call in and say my uh, solidworks is slow or i'm having performance issues we always start with, well, let's clear the registry. Let's make sure the graphics card is updated. Let's do the simple things first to make sure that those are all done and we check all those boxes. So let's go in this next part, assuming we've done all that. We've done the easy stuff and SOLIDWORKS is still really running slow. We're having some issues. So the answer in so many cases, this isn't just one. The answer in so many cases is let's check the BIOS. So in the BIOS, right, the BIOS is what boots up before, even before your operating system boots up on your machine. And we have to give a disclaimer there saying we're, we're not your IT team. You would really need to consult with your IT professionals before accessing and making changes to your BIOS. But this is the advice we can offer and, and, and um, you know, some information we can offer to better educate you and your IT team. So the first option in the BIOS that I've seen dramatically impact a bunch of Windows machines is something called Intel Speed Step. Intel Speed Step is basically a setting that allows the BIOS to dial back your processor speed if it senses lower power. So for many people, and this was on my very own machine this happened, I had a power supply that was going bad for my laptop, for my Dell laptop, and as the machine senses lower power coming from the power supply, it dials back processor speed to conserve power. And that's really interesting. And really what it's saying is we're trying to conserve power. We're trying to compensate for this uh, lower power state. And I've also seen this happen even if you're on battery. If you disconnect from the power supply and you're running your laptop on battery, and little did you know that in the background, Intel speed step can actually dial back your processor to conserve power in those cases. So I turn this off. I've advised customers, hey, it's, it's a simple option. You can toggle and use it as a troubleshooting step. Um, I think in some cases, these, these may not even be solutions. They're just troubleshooting steps to say, turn it off and let's see if it changes. Let's see if it gets worse or it gets better or doesn't change. And then we know um, we know a little bit more information. We know that the power of your computer might be involved one way or another. So that's the first item you're going to find in BIOS. On my machine, on Dell's, it's under performance. It's going to be different if you're on um, you know, a Lenovo or an HP or a box machine. The BIOSes are all different for those machines, but um, it's usually called something similar. And just a couple of BIOS bonus items. What else is in the BIOS that is very impactful here. The next um, really, really impactful item here is something called switchable graphics. And we could do a whole presentation really just on switchable graphics, but this is most common on laptops. I'll say specifically Dell laptops that have two graphics cards. And commonly Dell gra uh, laptops will ship with an integrated Intel graphics card and a dedicated nvidia card kind of like the card that's advertised when you buy the buy the computer the challenge with that is this option switchable graphics allows windows to switch between those cards to conserve power so if it senses you're you're using a program that doesn't require that higher end card it will actually d disable the nvidia card and just use the intel card and this wreaks havoc on SOLIDWORKS. This causes a lot of issues with SOLIDWORKS in general. And there's um, less um, direct ways to disable this. In, in the NVIDIA control panel, you can tweak a couple options to, to help with this. 
but the most direct way is just to completely disable switchable graphics. And I've, I've seen this really impact uh, a lot of machines very positively. So. Oh yeah. And it'll also take Sauer's composer down to its knees. That's very true. Composer composer is, one, is another one, Bob, I see with, with this specifically, that's really interesting. You bring that up. Composer is a smaller program than SolidWorks. I think this option in particular says, Oh, that, that, smaller program doesn't need the nvidia card but <laughs> the amd card and i totally agree it, it composer just go, comes to a crawl uh with it's that. like 75 percent of our support cases why doesn't composer work correctly it's usually yes. that yeah exactly yep okay uh, and then a little bios bonus here i just like this one because it's cool there's an option in your bios called usb power share um it's it's at least here on dells and i think there's similar stuff in other machines but it turns your machine into a battery pack. If you turn this on, you can have your machine, your, your laptop in your bag turned off and the USB ports will still be active for power. So if you're on the go and you want to use your laptop as like a gigantic remote battery, you can do that. You can, you can turn this on and it enables it to charge your, your devices as you're, as you're traveling, which is pretty cool. Although no one's traveling right now. So maybe, maybe not as relevant. Okay, building on that, building on everything we just talked about in the BIOS, why is my software so slow, even after clearing the registry, graphics card, and addressing all those things in the BIOS we just talked about? Uh, this is an interesting topic to navigate in tech support, because in a lot of cases, it ends up being a conversation between us and the IT team and not even the engineer. The answer is virtual memory depletion. So let me pull up test manager just to kind of reference my own machine here. This isn't a super machine. This is a pretty standard Dell uh, tower I'm running on right now. And if at first glance, right at first glance, it says I'm only using 6.5 gigs of about 16 gigs of RAM. Okay, so I should have plenty of overhead, plenty of uh, space left to continue, uh, continue working, continue opening new programs. But upon further inspection, if you click, if you click memory, we go in here in use, there's that 6.5 gigs. That makes sense. But what that doesn't account for is this standby memory or otherwise known as virtual memory category. In, in a lot of cases, a, a, a very um, frequent call in the tech support is my SOLIDWORKS is running slow as I'm opening files. I'm getting to a point where it either locks up or crashes or won't open any more files. This is the first thing I'll check. And very commonly, this standby group has depleted all of the free memory. So this is why this is misleading. Like I would think I have nearly 10 gigs free of, of memory, right? But I actually only have about six gigs free because this standby group is not accounted for in this graph. And you even get a better idea for it if you go into the actual resource monitor itself get a really nice breakout here of what is free and what is standby. And you can sort by this column. Uh, commit is the memory that's committed to every program that's not being used yet. It's basically like promised or virtual memory. So SolidWorks itself has, you know, 2.7 gigs here, quite a lot of, of memory committed to it. And it's actually only working with about a gig and a half. You can kind of see as that moves on down the line. I closed Chrome before this presentation because Chrome is a gigantic RAM resource hog. As you open every tab, it will commit another chunk and another chunk and another chunk in Chrome. And I've connected to customers' machines, and I'm sure you guys have seen this before, where you might have 100 Chrome tabs open. And I'm guilty of it as well. You go through the day and you open tabs, you never close them, and uh, you end up depleting all your memory. So I'm, I'm mentioning it here to say next time you, you are running into performance issues and you pull up the memory section, don't let this small graphic be the final result. D take a deeper dive. How much free memory do you actually have? At some point, if standby ends up using up all the free, um, you might be in a scenario where, where you are actually out of RAM, even though that the, the little graphic here is not telling you. And to, to, to put the final kind of nail in that coffin, right, uh, so to speak, there's a program from Microsoft called RAM Map. RAM Map is directly from Microsoft, from Cisternals, 
And this tool gives you an even deeper dive into your RAM and what's going on with it. And one of the functions of this tool is to empty the standby list, to kind of purge the standby list. Rebooting the machine will also purge the list. Rebooting will, will purge your standby and, and get you back, um, you know, with a clean kind of clean slate. But this is a way to do it on the fly. You close all your programs, you purge the list, and then you kind of continue working if you don't want to reboot your machine right then. So again, this this in itself is a very long topic, and we usually end up in, in back and forth with IT teams and trying to come up with the best solution. But um, the long and the short of this is don't let that small graphic be the, the final uh, solution or, or final uh, answer if you think you're running out of RAM. Okay, this last one, why is my solid work so slow? Part three, even after doing all the things we just talked about, <laughs> we went through everything we just talked about, SOLIDWORKS is still slow. What's going on? We'll probably at that point really need to take a deep dive into the actual data that you're working with, the, the files themselves. Are they slow on every machine? Are they only slow on your machine? Um, where are they stored? Are they stored locally? Are they stored in PDM? Are they stored on the server? Any one of those um, could have an impact on performance. But this, the answer here specifically, or this, the, the tool I'll, I'll bring up, time and time again, I'll show this to a customer and they say, hey, I've never seen that before. I really wish I knew about that before because this will really help the team. So with an assembly open, if we go to assembly visualization, this will color and sort your assembly based upon criteria. So in this case, maybe what's my heaviest part? What's my highest quantity part? Um, let me sort my parts alphabetically by part name. Or the part uh, I'm kind of getting to here is this performance analysis function, performance analysis. This is newer. It's, I think, in 2017 or 2018, this button was added as a shortcut. So if I press that button, it will automatically add these last three columns, total graphics triangles, SW open time and SW rebuild time. This will help you by these three categories, see what are your worst offenders? What are, what are the four parts that's causing me the most heartache or, or really dragging my assembly down the most? So in my case, if I said, what's, what's the part with the most graphics triangles, the part that is again, maybe impacting my performance the most. So I see the parts name. I, I can't really tell where it is quite yet. Maybe one strategy is to click it and do component preview window where it opens up on the on the right side here. And I see, oh yeah, there is a bunch of fillets on this. Um, I only have six of them in here, but the scenario where the customer is normally like, yeah, it's a simple part. It's got a, it's got a, a few fillets, but there's 400 of them in this assembly. So it's a very easy question to say, is it really necessary to have the fillets on all the time? Maybe for that particular part, you make a simplified version where the fillets are all suppressed and we remove a huge quantity of edges that SolidWorks has to calculate real time uh, as you're rotating and as you're opening the file and working with it, that will have a dramatic uh, impact on performance. And we wouldn't know that if we, if we didn't pull up this tool and really take a close look at it. SW open time and SW rebuild time are similar. O open time might be for very different reasons. Maybe it's stored on this particular file is coming from some guy's hard drive in another building. And we didn't know that until we noticed, oh, why is that one part taking so long to open? And then of course, SW rebuild time is, is there any part with a particular complex feature or, or um, you know, cut out or, or text or threads or something, again, that maybe we don't need to display that at our top level assembly all the time. Maybe this tool will help us kind of narrow it down and get rid of our, our worst offenders. So, yeah, uh, on, on the composer side of things, I had, I had a similar issue where a customer was just doing a simple frame. And I'm like, why is this file performing so terribly inside a composer? And I said, well, let's hop back into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at assembly visualization. And it pointed to a T nut and the guy just immediately slapped himself in the head. He's like, no, they didn't. And we look at the T nut and it had a helicoil insert inside of the T nut. You, you couldn't see the T nut. The T nut was always inside of a frame. Yeah. 
So he put it in there, and after he put it in, someone added all the extra detail and added a helix external and internal thread into it, which added, what was it, 85,000 polygons to that one part, and it was in the assembly 297 times. Exactly, yep. And, and Bob, I'll use the term again, composer is the innocent bystander, right? It's, it's, yes. it's the downstream impact uh, you know, of, of doing that. And this tool is just so great because it does all of those things for you right in one spot, uh, assembly visualization. And it's, of course, there in every version of SOLIDWORKS. You don't have to buy it separately or anything. And, and you can just, just uh, take a look at that. Yeah, there's there's some inspiration I've gotten from this visualization tool. I've actually write, written some APIs myself, which I'll I'll talk to you about later, Dan. But oh, cool. there's 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 some fun stuff that, that you can do with some of those tools. Cool. That's awesome. Okay. All right. So building on some of that stuff, right? And and all of those things, why is my solid work so slow? There's certainly other causes for that. There's certainly other things in support we've come across. Those are just some of the most common reasons or common things and or interesting causes for why solid work so slow. And some of that leads into even something as simple as this. Why does SOLIDWORKS RX say I haven't rebooted in several days? So if you've never seen it, I'm just going to pull up RX here uh, so we can take a look at it. SOLIDWORKS RX installs by default with every install of SOLIDWORKS. And one of its functions is it has a diagnostics tab and it will tell you basically in a single pane here, in a single snapshot, what graphics card you have, what driver that card currently has, um, how much RAM do you have, how much hard drive space, all everything you want to know about, you know, basic system performance. One of those things is last reboot of, uh, of in, in terms of hours. When did you last reboot? And I exaggerated the screenshot down here, right? So this guy's in rough shape. He's got an outdated driver um, and he hasn't rebooted in 32 days. But if, if we're talking about even before, we're talking about virtual memory depletion, we're talking about um, performance issues. I time and time again and, and I, I know my coworkers will say the same thing we'll come across customers machines that haven't rebooted in several days in four or five days in some cases and really what you're doing there is you're just depleting your resources as time goes on and eventually solidworks will kind of come to a crawl and, and you'll certainly run into an issue so this is the first thing we'll check is rx when's your last reboot let's just try and reboot and see if see if there's any impact there the challenge with that is in Windows 10, I'll uh, pull up, I can't, you can't see it because it's my other, on my other screen here, but in Windows 10, if you just hit shut down, shut down actually does not shut down the machine. There is a setting in Windows that will conserve your uh, programs, conserve where you are, and then shut the machine down. Let me see if I can dig through and find it. I think it was accounts. And then sign in option. Yeah, this one plagued me for a while. I was like, why is it doing this? This is a tough one. It is part called of the create fast update. start. Yep. Here it is, right? This is it here. So um, I found this just by, thank you, Jason, by the way. <laughs> I signed in and uh, found it here under sign in options under your home and settings. And there's an option for use my sign in to automatically finish setting up my device and reopen my apps after uh, after an update or after a restart. And in a lot of cases, that causes this timer just to continue on and it doesn't allow it to reset. It doesn't um, allow SOLIDWORKS to think you have rebooted recently. And I actually think that's an indicator in the background that you're not rebooting completely. You're, you're probably still holding on to some of those breadcrumbs or some of that memory from your last session of Windows. So believe it or not, restart is a stronger option out of the box with Windows 10 than shutdown is. So restart is a stronger option. You can also hold shift while you hit shutdown. If you hold shift, it will shut down the machine completely and, and uh, wipe, uh, wipe that, as Jason just mentioned, wipe that fast boot option. But this is interesting. I think there's a couple things at play here, but it really does get back into, are you seeing performance issues? Um, have you rebooted? Have you rebooted completely? And uh, maybe that's some of the advice we can kind of uh, hopefully offer in, in tech support. And Dan, we also had another one in there. It said, I see you also got the without an internet connection error. 
Um, mine's had that for a while. Any explanations? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I've definitely seen a, uh, a mixed bag of this particular field's feedback. <laughs> I'll say that much. Um, I think this is probably a firewall thing of, of RX not thinking it has access to the internet right now because of firewall settings on my machine. I clearly have internet. I'm, I'm talking, to, talking to everybody here. But um, Bob, I'll say this too, that recently SolidWorks has revamped this video card uh, page quite a bit. Yes. So if you guys haven't taken a look at this, this page um, uh, changed, I think it was probably two months ago or three months ago, right? That this this got a complete overhaul. And SolidWorks really just seems to be leaning more directly on NVIDIA and the other, other manufacturers for the drivers directly rather than hosting them themselves, which I think is a, which I think is probably a good strategy, but Bob, to your point and to this, to this great question, I think this field is a little suspect at the moment. I think they're, they're still. Yeah, I, I think so too. I was, I was looking it up in SolidWorks knowledge base and I couldn't find anything right at the moment, but yeah, going back to the video card thing, it, it's, it's one of those things. I actually had a conversation with the guy that revamped the page of world and it was, it was more about, as, as new drivers come out, they're working with SolidWorks. They're work, working with DS. They're working with those other vendors right. and figuring out fixes to problems. So if you're on an older video card driver, you're not getting those fixes. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yep. And and I I respect from SolidWorks' perspective. Let's just get them right from NVIDIA. They're they're providing the updates and they update those those pretty frequently now. Let's go directly to them to get the direct uh, driver updates. Yeah. And I was actually surprised just how much of a conversation SOLIDWORKS and NVIDIA and um, AMD actually have on a regular basis. Sure. So they are they are working on updating the drivers like monthly. Okay, so got just a few questions left here, a few cases left. I like this one. We're jumping right into sheet metal. I like this one because it's it's kind of a classic sheet metal question or classic sheet metal example that still comes up in tech support is how can I place a cut across a bend? How can I place a cut through a sheet metal part across one of its bent regions? Um, and the cuts placed in the flat don't seem to show when the part is folded. So what does all that mean exactly? And I know we're throwing a lot of sheet metal terms out there, but the idea is the, the customer maybe modeled this part. And of course, this is a simplified example, but the customer modified or, or modeled um, a really you know, nice sheet metal part, great bends. And they say afterwards, hey, I want to put a couple cuts that happen to intersect or come across a bend um, in the part. Well, from sheet metal perspective, you can certainly flatten the part and then add the cuts um, here on, on, the, on the part itself. The challenge with that is they're only going to show up after the flat pattern. They want to see them also when the part is folded. So here, prior to um, you know, prior to the, the part being flattened, still in the, the folded state, I see a couple of cuts kind of going across this cut region. So how is that possible? How would we achieve something like that? So there's two different approaches here. And the first I'll call attention to is this one, because it's, it's definitely the more imperfect approach. It's as simple as you think it would be, right? Put a cut at a kind of a obtuse weird angle there, and, and it will intersect and go across the bend and still um, you know, give you a kind of a, a flattened representation. But the challenge you run into is you end up with this like oblong shape in the flat pattern. You end up with this, what is really not a circle, this, this oblong shape that cuts through that uh, flattened, uh, flattened part and ends up cutting through the bent uh, region. So the answer, in, and this is an old command, this is an old function that SolidWorks still offers. The answer is the unfold and fold approach. And the reason I think this is interesting is just because these commands function as essentially bookends in, in, in this approach or in this uh, example. So even let's just kind of roll back and we'll see what we're talking about here. So with fold and unfold, unfold allows you to temporarily flatten a bend. So you say, you know what, I want to put a cut across this, but I don't want to do it after the flat pattern. Um, I can temporarily unfold the part and the, the command is as simple as you would expect it to be right if we did it from scratch if i said let me unfold this part i pick this as my fixed face i can 
pick my bend to unfold or I can collect all bends. I'm just going to pick my bend. I'm going to collect just this one bend. I just want to flatten this one bend, not the other bend as well. Now my part is in this temporarily unfolded state, temporarily flattened state. So I can do whatever I want to it, put my cuts across it, um, you know, add my new features. We'll get rid of that one I just created as an example. So afterwards, I end up with this uh, part just laying down. We add our cut extrude across this region. Simple example, right? But we can do whatever we want. In that cut extrude, because it's cutting through sheet metal, we have some additional options like normal cut, link to thickness, optimized geometry, all specific sheet metal functions that make this cut a nice, perfectly linked, uh, perfectly round cut. I'm, I'm embarrassed now. I'm realized I never put a dimension on that hole. So please don't, don't judge me. Fully defined every time. And uh, we'll jump out of that cut. And then when you're done, you just fold it back up as you would expect with the sheet metal fold command. The fold command works exactly as the un unfold does just the other way around. We pick bends and fold them back up. So this is one of those things that if you're not um, overly experienced with sheet metal, if you haven't been using sheet metal a lot in, in your environment or in your workplace, you might not come across something like that so easily, right? You, you see those commands and they're not that self-explanatory, but in sheet metal, the way we teach it is those commands, the unfold, and fold should be bookends to, to cuts or features you want to insert. So if you've already modeled your part, you've already gone through and, and created your sheet metal part, you can go back, temporarily unfold it, put some cuts in and, and fold it back up. And sometimes like the, the reason um, I'm saying these cases are interesting or the reason we're saying that this is something I want to review is because it's surprising that these questions still come in after all these years. And so if something comes in that I know I answered nine years ago or something, right? Th that alone is interesting because I know that this question is still out there. And maybe we as, as the reseller in, um, you know, uh, industry here haven't done a good enough job of, of educating about this particular topic. So that's why it's interesting. And that's why I want to kind of continue to talk about it. Okay, so why are old library features causing issues? That was a really generic question that came into tech support. And the customer, I don't have the customer file, it was extremely proprietary and I couldn't really recreate their part from 2009. That would have been pretty tough to do. So this one we'll have to talk through, but I think it'll, it'll make a lot of sense. But they're saying, hey, we have these parts and I blanked out the name of, of the creator here, but when we bring these parts into uh, SolidWorks through our library, it just adds a whole bunch of cuts to some cast parts. It was it was really sweet the way they were doing it, really nice. They had these cast versions of, of uh, I'll just say there were hubs. And as they drop these library features on, it puts a bunch of cuts that they don't have to do over and over and over again. Really cool approach. The challenge was the parts were created in 2009. So they're they're pretty old at this point, right? They're They're over 10 years old. And they're seeing rebuild issues, they're seeing performance issues, they're just seeing random problems with parts like this. In general, right, forget library features for a second. Old features, old parts tend to be problematic. And that's surprising at first, because you might say, hey, SolidWorks files should be good forever. It's a SolidWorks file. It, it was created in SolidWorks, it should be good forever and should never have any problems. Well, theoretically, the part actually builds year after year after year on that code. So if I open the example I'm showing here, right, if I open a part that was made in 2005, and this wasn't just a just a screenshot, but if it was made in 2005, it was reopened in 2015, we added some fillets, some cuts, some patterns and mirrored a bunch of stuff, you know, saved and closed, worked with for a long time and then reopened in 2020 and we added a delete base, a couple more holes a mirror, and then we uh, cut the part or split the part. This code actually stacks on top of itself year after year. It doesn't all update to 2020. The code or the underlying um, structure of this file doesn't all update to 2020 at the end of the road. It's having to patch together the code from those years, uh, year after year. And if you're familiar with SolidWorks, they update these features and they, they um, enhance these features every year. Things like Toolbox and Sheet Metal um, have had serious overhauls, like complete overhauls in some, in some years. 
So in tech support, when we start troubleshooting problematic features or problematic parts, that's one of the first things we'll do is, is open a part, open something in SolidWorks. So maybe I'll just pick any one of these, uh, like any one of these planes, for example, we'll go to properties. I can see when that part was created when this feature was was created by the very first date on that plane. So maybe in, in this case, again, I'm using an old template or I'm using an old, um, in this customer's case, I'm using an old uh, library part that we're just dropping these in and I, I get it. They were complex. They were very complex library features. Um, they don't wanna have to remodel them, but you know what, after 10 years, it might be worth the time and the effort at this point to remodel them and recreate them. When we learned this, when SolidWorks kind of shared this with us pretty recently, that hey, the, the file uh, builds upon itself year after year, we stack the code. This really helps you understand why, you know what, I wanna be using the latest and greatest code. If there's a part that you reuse over and over and over again, and it's critical to your business, it, it probably makes sense at this point to update it, get it into 2020 if it's been a number of years, and let's get that thing um, modernized and, and really, um, I mean, even imagine using a phone, a cell phone from 10 years ago, as compared to where that the code for that part file would be now, right? It'd be pretty, pretty uh, dramatically different. So that was an interesting one. Okay, so this was one of my most impactful cases to me for last year, um, in terms of like, hey, I'm going to remember this one forever, because um, it was a bit of a needle in a haystack. So the question was, why won't my PDF files print correctly? And the answer was, again, a needle in a haystack. And let's, let's really take a look at what that means. So if I open up a drawing here, I have, uh, for case 14, I have a drawing of that sensor enclosure. And for protecting this customer's, um, uh, again, information, all I've done is taken their problematic uh, issue and inserted it into one of my existing assemblies. So uh, pretty, pretty straightforward and certainly protects their information. So the question was, I'm printing this drawing. Why, uh, why does the, the PDF look um, washed out or some of the line qualities are, are low or even some of the views are completely missing? So there, here comes that term again, the, the PDF is really just a bystander, an innocent bystander of what's going on with the drawing. So I say, well, let's, let's go back and take a look at the drawing and see if there's anything in the drawing that's alarming or, or, or obviously needs attention. So the very first thing you notice is if we open this drawing, as I'm hovering over these views, my cursor is turning into that lightning bolt symbol saying that this view is actually in draft quality. And if a view is forced into draft quality, if you notice all these views are, it's SolidWorks noticing that there's an issue with that view and it's forcing it into draft quality to try and save some, some resources and try and make that view run a little faster. And you can do that manually. You can manually force a view to draft quality. But if you see SolidWorks is doing it by itself, to me, that's a, a red flag saying something's going on with that assembly. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. Let's go back to the assembly. So we've stepped from the PDF back to the drawing. Now we're stepping from the drawing back uh, to the assembly. Say, well, what's wrong with this assembly that it's causing those views to snap into uh, draft quality? And my approach for troubleshooting this, there's, there's a couple different ways. You can certainly go about this, but my approach has always been, let's just start suppressing items and see when that view comes out of draft quality. And I've made it really easy here, right? I've put the broken part last, and that's certainly uh, an easy, almost never happens scenario, right? The broken part is usually buried somewhere in a very complex assembly. But in, in this case, if you were to suppress this broken diode here, and I'll show you what's going on with that diode here in just a second, but we suppress that broken diode, I'll rebuild this assembly with control Q, We'll switch back to the drawing and rebuild the drawing here with a control, uh, control Q. And we can pick that view and just force it into high quality at that point and let the, the view recalculate and everything I'm starting to see is, is coming in. And the view is sticking to high quality. It's not forcing itself back to draft quality. So for me, as, as the tech support engineer, the person kind of troubleshooting what's going on with this, you have to look and see where you were. Okay, what did I suppress that caused that view to snap out of uh, out of draft and back into normal quality? That tells me where I need to focus my attention to. 
Maybe it was a subassembly. Maybe it was a group of four or five parts that you can kind of narrow in on. And you could do this in reverse order too. You could just suppress everything and start rolling it um, forward one part at a time until it breaks again. That's certainly another approach. But for me, okay, I found out, I narrowed it down. It's this diode, it's this one particular part. So I opened that part and said, what's going on with this part that um, something, something's wrong with it in, in this case? Well, even upon inspection, it doesn't look that bad, right? It, it, it looks okay. I don't, actually don't see any any major issues with it. I do a control Q. Um, I do uh, and maybe an evaluate, performance evaluation, a, evaluate check, and we do a check just to see if anything pops up. We do a stringent check and look for any like broken faces or open edges or anything like that. And maybe from our question before, I would check when was this part made? Okay, it was made in 2010. It's pretty old. Um, it's it's kind of an older part. It's not you know terribly old, but it's kind of older. Um, Mr. Customer, for me as the tech support engineer, an easy question or, or um, the most obvious answer is, is this one particular part um, that important to you? Or is this one particular part imported? Did you get it from someone else? Was it something that you even really need to show in this assembly? Could you recreate it? Could you get another copy of it? Do you have a backup of this one particular file? And I hang on to this diode because it's really simple and it will break year after year, no matter what assembly I put it into, no matter whatever, it um, under the hood, the underlying um, frame of this file is somehow broken. And it, it serves as a pretty good example to show how it ends up being one single edge on one single file in an a sub assembly in the assembly in the drawing which will impact the pdf all the way at the end so i really appreciate this case because as a support engineer you you don't you have to uh make sure you're not you know uh seeing the forest through the trees right you're not getting stuck or getting pigeonholed down um into one particular problem i could have got stuck at adobe i could have got stuck at hey is there something wrong with adobe that's not printing the pdf correctly but it ended up being one particular edge and it, it's this fillet edge every time every now and then when you rebuild this one fillet edge will disappear on the file. And uh, it was an easy fix customer had no problem i'll re replace that diode or get an alert just not show it or whatever and they were able to get their drawing printed and get out the door, but um, it's a reminder. Um, don't get lost um, searching for that needle in the haystack, you know, let's take a step back and, and simplify it um, as much as possible. So that's a pretty cool one. Okay, I'll finish on this one. We're, we're, we got about a little over 10 minutes left here. I'm going to finish on this one. And this is why are my features failing after simply breaking a reference? And this was another very interesting question in tech support and one we actually get quite often, right? So I'll go back to SolidWorks. And I'm going to file open here and we'll browse into our last folder uh, for questions here, case 15. And we'll open EOR. Oh, you know what? I just have a, uh, I think I have a example here, uh, uh, image rather. So we'll open up this GIF. See what screen that's going to pop up on. This one, here's the gift. Here we go. Got another screen. So with this customer, they're just choose, I, I blanked out all their information. Again, I couldn't recreate this file, so I just wanted to show something uh, along the way. But all they're doing is this is a looping video. They pick a particular feature, this surface offset in the tree, and they just want to break the reference. Say no problem. I, I just want to break this reference to this surface offset. I don't need that reference anymore. They hit break. And breaking a reference should not cause a feature to blow up, right? We break a reference and see that feature and then the two features right after it end up failing. And that was that's what prompted the call into tech support. So again, you know, you could kind of get stuck there and see, well, what's going on with that feature that that uh, you know is 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 maybe causing an issue. But it ended up being a larger scale issue than the customer really realized. So let's open up that part file that's in this uh, this folder here, this VOR example. And I think this will really help to tell the story as to what's going on here. So I have a, a really simple part here, right? Let's roll back so we can see. It's a simple box. We've, we've used this all the time to explain this particular option in SolidWorks. We shell that box out. 
great, looks good. And then I put a fillet on the outside edge of that box. And it works, it puts the fillet on it, but it doesn't quite look right, right? It, it, it certainly appears to have issues here. And I don't know how it was able to do that while maintaining the interior shell somehow. That's gotta be like a graphical anomaly, right? But the answer is in your SOLIDWORKS options. If I go to options, we go to performance. The very first checkbox is verification on rebuild. And this is an option that if a customer calls into tech support and a, a part is just doing something weird, a cut extrude won't work or a random feature like we just saw with that um, break reference failing, if that's happening, one of the first things I'll do is let's go turn on verification on rebuild, advanced body checking and rebuild the part. So let's do that here. I'll enable verification on rebuild. Hit okay, and I'm just gonna do control Q for rebuild. And then my fillet actually does end up failing. The interesting thing about that option is if you don't turn that on, SOLIDWORKS only checks new features against adjacent faces, faces that are directly adjacent to, to that new feature. It doesn't check it against all faces on the model. So in this case, with VOR turned on, it ends up checking this fillet against every face on the model, noticing, of course, that it will not work. It will not be able to make that fillet because of how the interior of this model is shelled. So I um, have definitely had a lot of challenging conversations with customers who have modeled a complete part. This is a really obvious example, right? But imagine you've modeled a complete part like that part I just showed you in that, in that animation. This is a, a, more, a much more complicated part with some surfacing. Uh, there's a move face in there. Like there's, there's definitely more complex features. And then you get all the way to the end and all you want to do is break a reference and everything blows up. I certainly understand why that's frustrating. And without VOR turned on, you actually have the opportunity or the possibility of missing issues or missing errors with a part that you didn't otherwise see. And I've actually wondered that about SOLIDWORKS for years is, you know, this, this should be on by default or at least should be known, uh, very obvious to you if this is not on. When you install SOLIDWORKS from scratch, I installed this week, this version, this is off by default it definitely makes you slower. It absolutely makes your rebuilds take longer and makes SOLIDWORKS in general run slower because everything is, is doing that more advanced rebuild. But for me as the user, um, what's the lesser of two evils? The possibility of missing an issue, missing a, a problem with a file, or maybe hurting your performance, or maybe just being aware of it. Maybe now you're aware of it and you can say, I can manage it. I know that when I'm working on advanced modeling techniques or complex models, I'm gonna turn that on. And when I'm done, when I'm more towards the end of my design cycle and I'm putting parts together and, and getting drawings done, maybe then you can turn it off. And even inside of the assembly option, uh, I'm, I'm here in assemblies, large assembly mode itself can disable this for you. So you have a lot of uh, functions and a lot of controls here, but, um, I'll just kind of zoom in so we can see this verification on rebuild is an, is a function of large assembly mode. So if you open a large assembly, you can have large assembly mode disable verification on rebuild. So that kind of gives you the best of both worlds. You can turn it on and when you open up something above 500 parts or whatever you want to specify, you can let large assembly mode uh, disable that if you would like. So it's, it's definitely a lot to take in and and I certainly felt for this particular customer because they had to go back. And when, when we ended up um, addressing this problem and, and taking a look at what, what happened, there was issues much further up the tree that they actually hadn't seen yet. There was parts um, that they had to go back and fix. And that, that's a tough pill to swallow if you've invested a lot of time in a part. So that's my rant about VOR, but if it were me, I would turn it on, be very aware of it. If you feel like it's slowing you down, you can disable it and large assembly mode can also disable it for you um, automatically. Okay, so we covered quite a bit, right? That's 15 completely different questions, complete, uh, completely different topics in uh, SOLIDWORKS. This presentation, I hope again, is, is kind of ever evolving and I hope to give it next year. I've already got three or four new cases for next year that we'll, we'll sprinkle in. 
I'm going to put my contact information here just for a moment, dwagner at cati.com. If, if you haven't given us a call on tech support recently, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you and, and help you through any, any problem you might be having. Yeah, I, I want to say, too, if, if, if anybody on the phone has something you say, hey, this would be really great for uh, your presentation, something very interesting. I, I still geek out on this kind of stuff. It's, it's just quirky issues or weird stuff that the public would uh, benefit from knowing. I'd, I'd love to hear about it.